Live from San Jose, it's theCUBE. Presenting Big Data Silicon Valley. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem partners. Welcome back to theCUBE. Our continuing coverage of our event, Big Data SV, continues. I'm Lisa Martin, joined by Peter Burris. We are in downtown San Jose at a really cool place called Forager Tasting and Eatery. Come down, hang out with us today as we have continued conversations uh, around all things big data, everything in between. This is our second day here, and we're excited to welcome to theCUBE the CMO of Vantic, Blaine Matthew. Blaine, great to meet you, great to have you on the program. Great to be here, thanks for inviting me. So Vantic, you guys are up the street in Walnut Creek. What do you guys do, what are you about, what makes Vantic different? Well, in a nutshell, Vantic is a so-called high productivity application development platform to allow developers to build, deploy, and manage uh, so-called event-driven real-time applications, the kind of applications that are critical for driving many of the digital transformation initiatives that enterprises are trying to get on top of these days. Digital transformation, it's a term that can mean so many different things, but today it's essential for companies to be able to compete, especially enterprise companies with newer companies that are more agile, right. more modern. But if we peel apart digital transformation, there's so many elements that are essential. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you guys help companies, enterprises, say, evolve their application architectures that might currently not be able to support right, an actual right. transformation to a digital business? Well, I think that's a great question, thank you. I think the key to digital transformation is really a, a lot around the concept of real time, okay? The reason Uber is disrupting, or has disrupted the taxi industry is the old way of doing it was somebody called the taxi and then they waited 30 minutes for a taxi to show up and then they told the taxi where to go and hopefully they got there. Whereas Uber turned that into a real time business, right? You called, you pinged something on your phone, they knew your, your location, they knew the location of the driver, they matched those up, brought them together in real time, already knew where to bring you to and ensured you had the right route in that location. All of this data flowing, all of these actions have been taken in real time. The same thing applies to an, a disruptor like Netflix, okay? In the old days, Blockbuster used to send you, you know, a leaflet in the mail telling you what the new movies are. Maybe it was personalized for you, probably not. Now Netflix knows who you are instantly, gives you that information, again, in real time based on what you've done in the past and is able to give you, deliver the movie also in, in real time. Pretty well every disruptor you look at around digital transformation is bringing a business or a process that was done uh, slowly and impersonally to, to make it happen in real time. Unfortunately, uh, enterprise applications and the architectures, as you said a second ago, that are being used in most applications today weren't designed to enable these real-time use cases. Uh, a great example is Salesforce. So a Salesforce is a pretty standard, what you'd call a request response application. So you make a request, a person generally makes a request of the system, system goes into a database, uh, queries that database, finds information, and then returns it back to the user. And that whole process could take and could take you know, significant amounts of time, especially if the right data isn't in the database at the time and you have to go request it or find it or create it. Uh, a new type of application needs to be created that's not fundamentally database centric, but it's able to take this, these real time data streams coming in from devices, from people, from enterprise systems, process them in real time and then take an action. So I'm a, let's pretend I'm a CEO. Yeah. One of the key things you said, and I want you to explain it better, is event. Is what what? Is, an, is event? Mm -hmm. What is an event, and yeah. how does that translate into a digital business decision? Yeah, this notion of complex event processing CEP has been around in technology for a long time, and yet, and yet uh, it, it surprises me still, a lot of folks we talk to, CEOs have never heard of the concept, and it's very simple, really, an event is just, something that happens in the context of business. That's as complex and as simple as it is. An event could be a machine increases in temperature by one degree, a car moves from one location to another location, it could be an enterprise system like an ERP system, you know, approves a PO, it could be a person pressing a button on a mobile device. 
all of those, or it could be an IoT device putting off a signal about the state of, of a machine. Increasingly, we're getting a lot of events coming from IoT devices. So really, any particular interesting business situation or a change in a situation that happens is an event. And increasingly driven, as you know, by IoT, by uh, augmented reality, by AI and machine learning, by autonomous vehicles, by all these new real-time technologies are spinning off more and more events, streams of these events coming off in rapid fashion and we have to be able to do something about them. Let me take a crack at it and you tell me if, if, I, if I've got this right. That historically, applications have been defined in terms of processes. And so in many respects, there was a very concrete, mm -hmm. discrete, well-established and program set of steps that were performed right. and then the transaction took place. An event, it seems to me, is, yeah, we generally described it, but it changes in response to the data. Right. So right. An event is kind of like an outside in, driven by data, right. Right. Uh, uh, system, uh, system response, whereas your traditional transaction processing is an inside out, driven by a sequence of program steps, yep. and that decision might have been made six years ago. Yep. So the event is what's happening right now, right. informed by data, versus a transaction, traditional transaction is much more, yep. what do we decide to do six years ago, and it just gets sustained. Have I got that right. right? Absolutely right, or six hours ago, or even six minutes ago, which might seem, wow, six minutes, that's pretty good. But take a use case for uh, a field service agent trying to fix a machine or an air conditioner on top of a building. In today's world now, that air conditioner has hundreds of sensors that are putting off data about the state of that air conditioner in real time. The service tech has the ability to, while the machine is still putting off that data, be able to make repairs and changes and fixes, again, in the moment, see how that is changing the data coming off the machine, and then continue to make the appropriate repairs in collaboration with a smart system or an application that's, that's helping identifying them. identifying patterns about what the problem <laughs> exactly. is. Versus some, the old ways was, well, we had a recipe of right. you know, steps that you went through in the call center right. and right. the customer's getting more and more yeah. frustrated. They got their clipboard out and had the 52 steps they right. followed to see, oh, that didn't work, now the next step. No, data can help us do that much more efficiently and effectively if we're able to process it in real time. So in many respects, what we're really talking about is an application world or a world looking forward where the applications which historically have been very siloed, process driven, to a world where the application function is much more networked together. And the application, yeah. the output of one application is having a significant impact through data on right. the performance of an application somewhere else. That right. seems like it's right. got the potential to be an extremely complex fabric. <laughs> so do I yeah. wait until I figure all that out <laughs> and then I start building it? Or do I, I mean, how do I do it? Do I start yeah. small and yeah. Yeah. accrete and grow into it? What's yeah. the best way for people to start working on this? Well, you're absolutely right. Building these complex, uh, geeking out a little bit, you know, asynchronous, non-blocking, so-called reactive applications, that's the, the concept that we've been using in computer science for some time, is very hard, frankly, okay? It's, it's much easier to build computing systems that, that process things step one, step two, step three in order, but if you have to build a system that is able to take real-time inputs or changes at any point in the process at any time and go in a different direction, it's very complex and computer scientists have been writing applications like this for decades, it's possible to do, but that isn't possible to do at the speed that companies now want to transform themselves, right? By the time you spec out an application and spend two years writing it, your business, your competitors have already disrupted you, your, the requirements have already changed, you need to be much more rapid and agile. And so the secret sauce to this whole thing is to be able to write these transformative applications or create them, not even write is actually uh, the wrong word to use, to be able to create generate them. Generate them. Yeah, generate them in a way which is very fast, does not require a guru level developer in reactive, uh, reactive Java or some super low level code that you'd have to use to, to otherwise do it, so that you can literally have business people help design the applications conceptually, build them almost in real time, get them out into the market, and then be able to modify them as you need to you know, on the fly. If I can build on that just for one second. So it used to be we had this thing called computer assisted software engineering. <laughs> right, right. We, we right. were going to operate in this very, very high level language. It kind of 
But then we would use code and build the code, and the two of them were separated. Right. And so right. the minute that we deployed, somebody would go off and main maintain, and the whole thing would break. Right. 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 Do you have that problem? No. Well, that that's exactly right. So the old, uh, you know, the old. The uh, previous way of doing it was about really modeling an application, maybe visually, drag and drop, uh, but then fundamentally you created a bunch of code and then your job, as you said after, was to maintain and, and deploy and Try manage. Try to sustain some connection <laughs> back up to that beautiful visual right. model. And you probably didn't, because that, right. that was too much work, so forget, forget about the model after that. In, instead, what we're able to do these days is to build the applications visually, you know, really for the most part, with either super low code or in many cases no code, because we have the ability to abstract away a lot of the complexity, a lot of the complex code that you'd have to write, we can represent that, okay, with, with these logical abstractions, create the applications themselves, and then continue to maintain, add to, modify the application using the exact same structure. You're not now stuck on, now you're stuck with 20,000 lines of code that you have, to, you have to edit. You're continuing to run and maintain the application just the way you built it, okay? We've now got to the place in, in you know, computer science where we can actually do these things. We couldn't do them you know, 20 years ago with Case, but we can absolutely do them now. So I'm hearing from a, a customer internal perspective a lot of operational efficiencies that uh, Vantic can drive. Let's look now at, at, from a customer's perspective, what are the yeah. business impacts they're able to make? You mentioned the word reactive a minute ago and you were talking about applications, but mm -hmm. do you have an example where you've, Vantic has enabled a customer, a business to be more, to be proactive and be able to identify through you know, complex event processing what their customers are doing to be able to deliver relevant messages and really drive revenue, drive profit. Right, right. So many, you know, so many great examples. Uh, and I, me I mentioned field service uh, a few minutes ago. We've got a lot of clients in that doing this real-time field service using these, uh, these event processing applications. One that I want to bring up in a, right now is uh, one of the largest global shoe manufacturers, actually, that's a client of Vantic. I unfortunately can't say the name right now because they want to keep what they're doing uh, under wraps, but we all definitely know the company. And they're using this to manage their, uh, the security primarily around their real-time global supply chain. So they've got a big challenge with uh, companies and in different countries redirecting shipments of, of their shoes, selling them on the gray market at different prices than what are allowed in particular different regions of the world. And so through both sensorizing the packages, the barcode scanning, the enterprise systems bringing all that data together in real time, they can literally tell in the moment if something is be if a, if a package is redirected to the wrong region or if literally a shoe or a box of shoes is being sold where it shouldn't be sold at the wrong price. It used to, they used to get a monthly report on, on the activities and then they would go and investigate what happened last month. Now their fraud detection manager is literally sitting there getting this in real time saying, oh, Singapore sold a pallet of shoes that they should not have been able to sell five minutes ago. Call up the guy in Singapore and have him go down and see what's going on and, and fix that issue. Uh, that's, that's pretty powerful. Definitely, so like it. reduction in fraud or increase in fraud detection. Yeah. Uh, probably sounds like too there's a potential for a significant amount of cost savings to the business. Not just meeting the external customer needs, but from a, from a, a cost perspective, yeah. reduction, not just in probably TCO, but in operational expenses. For sure, although I would say most of the digital transformation initiatives, when we talk to CEOs and CIOs, they're not, uh, they're not focused as much on cost savings as they're focused on A, avoiding being disrupted by the next interesting startup, B, creating new lines of business, new revenue streams, finding out a way to do something differently or dramatically better than they're currently doing it. It's not only about optimizing or squeezing some cost out of, their, out of their current application, this thing that we are talking about, I guess you could say it's an improvement on their current process, but really it's actually something they just weren't even really doing before. Just a total different way of doing fraud detection and managing their global supply chain that they just, just fundamentally weren't even doing. And now, of course, they're looking at many other use cases across the company, not just in supply chain, but you know, smart manufacturing, so, so many use cases. To your point about, about savings, though, there's you know, what value does the application itself bring? Then there's the question of what does it cost to build and maintain and deploy the application itself, right? 
And again, with these new visual development tools, they're not modeling tools, you're literally developing the application visually. Uh, you know, I've been in so many scenarios where we talk to large enterprises, we, you know, we talk about what we're doing, like, like we talk about right now, and they say, okay, we'd love to do a POC, proof of concept. We want to allocate six months for this, for this POC, like normally you would probably do for building most enterprise applications. And we inevitably say, well, how about Friday? Does, could, how, about, could we, how about we have the POC done by Friday? And you know we get the the Germans laugh uh, you know laugh uncomfortably and and we go away and deliver the POC by Friday because of how much different it is to build applications this way versus writing low level Java or C sharp code and sticking together a bunch of technologies and tools because we abstract all that away and you know the eyes drop open and the and the mouth drops open and it's it's incredible what modern technology can do to radically change how software is being developed. Wow. Big impact in a short yep. period of time. That, that's always a nice, a nice thing to be it able is. to deliver. It is. Well, to, it's great to be able to surprise people. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Blaine, thank you so much for stopping by, sharing what Vantic is doing to help companies be disruptive, and for sharing those great customer examples. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. Appreciate the time. And for my co-host Peter Burris, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching the Cube's continuing coverage of our event, Big Data SV, live from San Jose, down the street from the Strata Data Conference. Stick around, we'll be right back with our next guest after a short break. <laughs>